A cat, a man, and two women. Written by Junichiro Tanizaki. Translated by Paul McCartney. Dear Fukuko, please forgive me. I had to borrow Yuki's name for the return address on this letter. But it's not really Yuki, I'm afraid. From what I've said, I'm sure you've already guessed who it is. Or rather, you must have known from the moment you opened the envelope. Oh, it's her, you said to yourself. Then getting angry, how rude. She's got some nerve, using a friend's name so I'd read the letter. But just think for a moment, Fukuko. If I'd used my own name, he would have seen it and intercepted the letter. I'm sure of that. And I wanted to be sure you'd read this. So you see, there was no other way. But please set your mind at rest. I have no intention of blaming you for what happened or playing on your sympathy. If I wanted to, a letter 10 or 20 times as long as this wouldn't be enough. But that wouldn't serve any purpose now, would it? Ha ha ha. No, indeed. Why? I've really become quite strong. After all I've been through. I don't spend all my time crying, you know. Even though I have plenty of reasons to cry and to be angry. But I decided not to think about things like that anymore. Just carry on with my life as cheerfully as I know how. After all, only God knows what will happen to anybody in this life, so it would be foolish to let yourself hate and envy other people because of their good fortune, wouldn't it? Of course I know it's rude of me to write to you directly like this. I may not have much education, but I know that much. But I've had Mr. Tsukamoto mention this to him lots of times and he just won't listen. So the only way left was for me to ask you for help. But like that, it sounds like I'm going to ask you to do something difficult, but it won't be any trouble to you at all, really. There's just one thing I want from you, and of course, by that, I don't mean I want you to return him to me. No, it's something much, much more trivial than that. It's Lily I want. From what Mr. Tsukamoto says, he wouldn't mind giving her to me, but you keep saying no. Oh, Fukuko, could that be true? Are you actually interfering with the granting of my warning on your wish? Please consider, Fukuko. I gave you the man who meant more to me than life itself. And not only that, I gave you everything from that happy household we'd built together as a couple. I didn't take so much as a broken teacup away with me. I didn't even get back most of the things I brought with me when I married him. Of course, it may be better not to have things around that would bring back sad memories of the past. But don't you think you could at least let me have Lily? I won't make any other unreasonable demands. I've put up with everything. I've been beaten up, knocked down, and trampled on. Considering all I've sacrificed, is it too much to ask for one little cat in return? To you, it's just a worthless little animal, but what a consolation it would be to me. I don't want to seem like a crybaby, but without Lily, I'm so lonely I can hardly stand it. Why, there's nobody in this world, whole world who will have anything to do with me now, except for that cat. I've been completely defeated, and now, do you really want to make me suffer even more? Are you that true that you don't feel even a grain of pity for me in my loneliness, my unhappiness? No, no, you're not that kind of person. I understand that perfectly. It's not you who won't give Lily up, but him. Yes, I'm sure of it. He loves her. I might be able to do without you, he used to say. But do without Lily? Never. And he always paid much more attention to her than he did to me at the dinner table and in bed. So why doesn't he just come right out and say he doesn't want to let her go? Why does he put the blame on you? This is something for you to think about, Fukuko. Well, he got rid of nasty old me and has started a new life with you, the girl he loves. 
As long as it was me he was with, he needed Lily. But why should he now? Isn't she just a bother to have around? Or could it be that even now, without her, there would be something missing? Does that mean that he looks on you, like me, as something a little lower than a cat? Oh, but forgive me. I've gone and said more than I meant to. I'm sure he wouldn't be as stupid as that. Still, the fact that he's trying to hide his feelings for Lily and blame everything on you might mean that he's a little worried. Oh dear, silly me, going on as if it was my business. But anyway, do be careful, Fukuko dear. Don't think, oh, it's just a cat, or you may find yourself losing out to it in the end. I would never give you bad advice. I'm thinking of you, not myself, in all of this. Get Lily away from him just as soon as you can. And if he refuses to let her go, won't that seem even more suspicious? Fukuko stored all this away and began to observe Shozo and Lily's behavior more carefully. She watched Shozo enjoying his sake with a dish of marinated horse mackerel to go with it. He took a sip, then put the small cap down and said, Lily! Picking up a fish with his chopsticks, he held it high in the air. Lily had been standing on her hind legs with her four paws resting on the edge of the oval dining table and staring, motionless, at the fish lying on the plate in front of her master. She looked like a customer propping himself up against a bar somewhere or like one of the gargoyles gazing down from the spires of Notre Dame. When the piece was lifted from the plate, Lily's nostrils began to quiver and her large, intelligent eyes grew quite round, as if with human amazement, as she gazed up at the longed for morsel. But Shozo was not inclined to give in so easily. Here it goes, he teased dangling the fish right in front of Lily's nose before suddenly snatching it away and popping it into his own mouth. Then, he noisily slurped away at the dressing that covered the mackerel, crunched down through the brittle bones, and began the whole process again with the next piece. Bringing it close, then withdrawing it to a distance, raising it, then lowering it, he tantalized the cat. Lifting her paws from the table and bringing them up high on either side of her chest in ghostly fashion, Lily began to pursue the fish, tottering after it on her hind legs. If the prey was brought to a standstill just over her head, the cat would fix it intently with her eyes and then make a leap for it, darting out with her front paws to seize it. She would just fail to get it, fall back, then leap again. It took her five or ten minutes of such frantic activity to secure one mackerel. Shozo repeated the same thing over and over again. He would give her a fish, then himself a little drink, and calling Lily would raise the next prize high. There must originally have been some twelve or thirteen mackerel on Shozo's plate, each about two inches long of which he himself had actually eaten perhaps three or four. For the rest, he had simply sucked out a bit of the vinegar dressing before giving the flesh to Lily. Oh, 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 that hurts! Shozo let out a shriek. Lily had leapt onto his shoulders and dug in her claws. Get down, get down from there! It was past the middle of September, and the last traces of summer heat were fading away. But Shozo, who, like most fat people, disliked the heat and was prone to sweating, had brought a low table out at the edge of the back veranda, now muddy from a recent flood. He sat on top of it, wearing only linen half drawers, a short sleeved undershirt, and a wooden stomach band. The shoulders Lily had jumped onto were fleshy and round like little nails, and to keep from sliding off, she naturally had to use her claws. As they dug through the 
Tim caught an undershirt and bit into Shaw's flesh, he gave another cry of pain. Get down from there, you! He shouted, shrugging her shoulders violently and leaning to one side to encourage her to leap off. But the cat, determined to maintain her perch, just dug her claws in deeper until Shaw's undershirt began to be dappled with spots of blood. Yet, though he grumbled about her wildness, he could never bring himself to be really angry with her. Lily seemed to be fully aware of this as she gently rubbed her face against his cheek with little flattering noises, and if she saw that his mouth was full of fish, boldly brought her own right up to her master's. If Shazo interrupted his chewing to poke out a piece of fish with his tongue, Lily would not nimbly dart her head forward to seize the morsel. Occasionally, she would devour it all at once. At other times, she would lick the remnants from around Shazo's mouth carefully and complacently. There were even times when Cat and Master would contend for the same piece, each tugging at one end. Then Shazo would put on an angry act, complete with grunts and cries, frowns and grimaces, and a little spitting. Actually, though, he seemed to be enjoying himself just as much as Lily was. Resting a bit from these exhausting games, he casually held out the sake cup for a refill. Hey, what's wrong? Suddenly anxious, he looked up at his wife, who had been in a sunny mood until just a while ago, but was now fixing him with a steady gaze, her hands thrust into her sleeves instead of offering the expected drink. There's no more sake, he ventured, looking with worried surprise into his wife's eyes and slowly withdrawing the cup. She had a calm, unflinching look about her as she announced, There's something I want to talk about, and then settled into a rather gloomy silence. What? What about? I want you to give that cat to Shinako. But why? To make a demand like that out of the blue? Why? It was outrageous, thought Shozo, blinking furiously for a few moments. But his wife looked in no mood to be trifled with, and he was at a loss what to think or do. But why this all of a sudden? Never mind why. Just give her the cat. Call Mr. Tsukamoto over tomorrow and be done with it. But what's the point of all this anyway? So you refuse? Now hold on a minute. How can I agree when you won't even tell me why? Are you angry about something? Something I did? Could Fukuko be jealous of Lily? He considered this possibility for a moment, but then dismissed it as making no sense. After all, Fukuko herself was basically fond of cats. When Shozo was still living with his former wife, Shinako, he had sometimes mentioned her occasional jealousy of the cat to Fukuko who had always made rather scornful fun of this sort of silliness. Obviously then, she had known all about Shaz's fondness for cats before she came to live with him. Moreover, since coming, she too had shown affection for Lily, though not to Shaz's extreme extent. She had never said a word against Lily for barging in on the couple's daily meals together as the cat had just done today. And when like today, Shozo took time over his evening bottle of sake to play with Lily, Fukuko usually enjoyed watching their circus-like performance and sometimes even tossed the cat a scrap or two herself or made her jump for one. Thus, Lily's interposed presence had the effect of binding the newlywed couple more closely making their suppers together times of laughter and relaxation. She, certainly, she had caused no trouble or bother. But what was the problem then? Everything had been fine up to yesterday, or rather, up till just now, until Shaw's fifth or sixth cup had some little slip of his upset his wife to make the situation suddenly change so completely. 
or was she starting to feel sorry for Shinako? Was that why she demanded that he hand over his cat to his ex-wife? It was, of course, true that when Shinako left, she had asked for Lily as part of the settlement, and afterwards, she had dispatched Tsukamoto several times with the same request. But Shozo had decided it was best not to even discuss the matter, and steadily re refused to do so. The point of Shiniko's message via Tsukamoto was that, though she should really have no regrets about leaving a man heartless enough to drive his own wife from her home and then drag in some other woman to take her place, yet somehow she couldn't forget him. No matter how hard she tried to hate and resent him, it was simply impossible. That's why she wanted something to remember him by. Couldn't she perhaps have Lily as a kind of souvenir? It's true that when they were living together, she had resented all the love that Shouzo had shown the cat and had sometimes mistreated her a bit on the side. But now, every single thing from their old house was filled with memories, and Lily especially. Shinako wanted at least to have Lily, in place of the child they'd never had, so she could lavish her affection on her that would, to some extent, make up for all the sadness and loneliness of her life. So you see, Tsukamoto would conclude, it's just a matter of that cat, Mr. Ishii. You can't help feeling sorry for her, can you, when you hear how she feels and all? But Shozo's reply was unvarying. You can trust a word that woman says. Shinako specialized in driving hard bargains, and she was crafty. There was no reading her. Whatever she said was to be taken with a large quantity of salt. In this case, for example, her tender words about missing Shozo and loving Lily were very suspicious, coming from such a tough, stubborn character. Love Lily, indeed. Why should she? Probably she just wanted to take her off somewhere and torment her out of spite. Or maybe the aim was to just get back at Shozo by taking something he valued away from him. No, that was too childish a revenge for her. At any rate, the rather simple-minded Shozo was unable to guess her real intentions, which made him feel all the more uneasy and resentful. Who was she to make all these selfish demands on him anyway? Of course, he had been in a weak position especially since he had wanted to get her out of the house as soon as possible. That's why he'd accepted most of her requests. But he'd be damned if he would let her take Lily now, on top of everything else. And so, Shozo continued to evade, with his characteristic variety of roundabout arguments and excuses, even Tsukamoto's most insistent pleadings. Fukuko naturally was in complete agreement with this policy, and indeed took an even harder line than did her husband himself. So tell me the reason. I haven't a clue what this is all about. Shozo reached out for the sake bottle and helped himself to another cup. Then, giving his thigh a smart slap, he glanced nervously around the room and said, half to himself, don't we have any mosquito coils? It was getting dark and a small cloud of mosquitoes was advancing towards the veranda from below the wooden fence nearby with a high-pitched hum. Lily had been curled up beneath the table with an air of having slightly overindulged. But when the couple's stock began to turn to her, she slipped down into the garden, insinuated herself beneath the fence, and disappeared, as if out of a feline sense of delicacy. The effect was comical, though in fact, Lily always absented herself for a while after eating a really large meal. Fukuko went into the kitchen without saying a word and returned with the mosquito coil, which she lit and placed under the dining table. Then, in a gentler tone than before, she asked, You gave all the mackerel to the cat, didn't you? You couldn't have had more than two or three yourself. I really don't remember. I was counting. There were 13 fish on the plate, 
Maybe ate 10, so that means you ate 3. What if I did? You think there's nothing wrong with that? Well, think again. Now I'm not going to get jealous over some cat, but you insisted I make marinated mackerel because you like it, even after I told you I can't stand it myself. Then you hardly touch it, and give it all to the cat? This was the burden of Fukuko's complaint. In the towns along the Osaka Kobe railway line, the Shinomiya, Asia, Ozaki, Sumiyoshi, horse mackerel and sardines taken from the ocean nearby were brought for sale almost every day. Fresh caught, as the fishmongers called out on their rounds. The price was from 10 to 15 cents per bucket, which was just enough to feed a family of three or four. When sales were good, Several fishmongers would appear each day. During the summer, the fish were each only about one inch long, and though they gradually grew in size as autumn approached, in their smaller state they were unsuitable for either frying or broiling with salt. They had to be roasted plain, marinated in soy and vinegar sauce, and eaten bones and all with some shredded ginger on top. But Fukuko had objected to preparing them this way, since she disliked the soy vinegar marinade. She liked warm, oily foods. It depressed her to have to eat cold, stringy dishes like horse mackerel. Confronted with this old, typical fussiness on Fukuko's part, Shozo told her to make what she liked for herself. He wanted mackerel and he would fix it on his own. When a fish sailor came around, he called him in and bought some. Now, Fukuko was a cousin of Shozo's, and given the circumstances under which he became his wife, there was no need for her to worry about pleasing a difficult mother-in-law. So from her second day of married life, she did just as she pleased in everything. All the same, she could hardly stand by and watch her husband trying to build a kitchen knife. So in the end, she made a marinated fish for both of them, though under protest. To make matters worse, they had been dining off mackerel for five or six days running. Then, two or three days ago, it had struck her. Shozo wasn't eating the food he'd insisted on having, ignoring his wife's complaints, Instead, he was giving it all to the cat. The more she thought about it, the clearer it all became. The mackerel were small with little bones easily chewed. There was no need to fillet them, and they could be served cold. And one got a lot for one's money. In other words, they were an ideal food to serve to the cat on a daily basis. They weren't Shaza's favorite dish, but the cat's. In this household, the husband, ignoring his wife's preferences, planned the evening menu with his pet alone in mind. Fukuko had been prepared to sacrifice her own tastes for her husband's cake, while in fact it was for the cat that she cooked that she had become a companion to the cat. That's not true. I always plan to eat them myself, but that really just keeps after me and I end up tossing them to her one after the other. What a liar! You pretend to like them just so you can give them all to me. Your cat means more to you than I do. How can you say that? Shoza spat the words out with a great show of indignation, but Fukuko's final comment had clearly devastated him. Am I more important then? Of course you are, don't be silly. Then show me instead of just talking about it. Otherwise, how can I believe you? All right, starting tomorrow, I won't buy another matter. That should satisfy you. Forget about that and just get rid of Lady. Once that cat is out of the way, everything will be fine. She couldn't mean it, but he mustn't treat the matter lightly or she might get even more worked up. Shozo very rearranged his limbs into the formal seating posture, with his knees close together, leaned forward, placing his hands politely on his knees and said in a pitiful, pleading sort of way, You mean you'd send her off to a place where you know she'd be mistreated? 
How could you suggest anything so cruel? Please don't say things like that. There, you see, that cat is more important to you. I tell you, if you don't do something about her, I'm leaving. Don't be silly. I'm not going to be put in competition with some animal. Suddenly, tears welled up, from anger perhaps. Lay seemed to take Fuku for herself by surprise, for she hurriedly turned her back on her flustered husband.